our final panel today is about the need for more sustainable food businesses. Businesses that uphold sustainable practices and how they source, produce, and serve or sell food can play a crucial role in transforming the food system. Many companies talk about sustainability, but they, a lot of them do it without walking the talk. But many others are on a journey to find ways to grow food more sustainably while protecting workers' rights and animal welfare, as well as preserving natural resources. It's that journey for better tasting, more sustainably produced food that inspires our keynote speaker, Scott Davis. Scott, until just this month, was the Executive Vice President and Chief Concept Officer at Panera Bread. He worked there for nearly 20 years, helping the company work directly with farmers to provide antibiotic-free protein to the company's restaurants. This panel will be uh, moderated by another one of my favorite uh, reporters, Eliza Barclay. She is also a reporter at National Public Radio and writes for their award-winning food blog, The Salt. She covers food, health, and science, both on the web and on air. I don't know who is covering food at NPR today, since Allison and Eliza are both here, but I'm, I'm really grateful that both of them were able to share their expertise. So please join me in welcoming Scott, Eliza, and our panelists to the stage. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everybody. Ready for, the, ready for the finale here today? Ready to go? All right. So, interesting quote. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a quote by a fellow named William Gibson, a writer, sci-fi sci writer from the early 90s. And that was a quote that served me well in the last 20 plus years of trying to push forward change at a company like Panera and in the food businesses in general. And I can tell you, the future actually is here today. But it isn't evenly distributed. And ultimately, the restaurant business is starting to figure that out. But let's take a little bit of a look at what's going on around the food business, and, and particularly the restaurant industry, and how that's moving forward, and some of the challenges there. And when you think about it, <clears throat> the, the restaurant industry is always focused on the customer, more than you, anyone realizes. And I can tell you today, as you sit, and I have, having done this for 20 so years, when you sit in the boardrooms of major restaurant companies, what we're talking about is how do you be competitive? How do you stay relevant for your target customer, for the audiences in general? And I can tell you around the country today, in every major boardroom, in every major restaurant chain, they're being presented with big, thick decks explaining how the world is changing around them. And it's terrifying. I can tell you, I've heard it, I've seen it. I've been a little terrified, I get it. And what's happening is health is showing up in a way that we've never seen before in the restaurant industry by our consumers. And what's driving that? What's driving that are the millennials. Millennials today are becoming a serious, serious force inside the restaurant industry. When you think about restaurants, and when I was a kid, we went to a restaurant, it seemed like maybe once or twice a year. I think I do that every day now. And I think most of us have seen a dramatic rise in how often we frequent restaurants and quick service restaurants, fast food places drive throughs coffee shops, they're everywhere. And just to give you a sense of it, when I started in the industry, it was a $15 billion a year industry. Today, it's a almost $700, a $700 billion a year industry, and that's in just about 30 years. So it's a huge industry, it's got a lot of power, and it's, got, and it's facing a huge, huge challenge from this group called the Millennials, who are becoming the workforce today. And, they are, and they have a different opinion about food, and they think of it differently, than folks like myself or baby boomers have thought about it over the years. And one of the key things is when they think about good for me food, they don't think necessarily how many calories or how much fat or that sort of stuff is important. But the reality is things like where did it come from? What's the story behind the food? How sustainable is it? What's its impact on the, on the planet? Those are becoming key issues around the restaurant industry and it's being driven by consumers who are demanding it. And what you see out there today are restaurants trying to understand how to make that work in that world. And, and the reality is, when you think about it, they're not just looking for a better, a better sort of food quality. They're looking to make a difference, because that's what they believe in. We all believe in making a difference at some level. 
but the millennial generation is pushing hard and forcing companies into that world. And you know, it's funny, when you think about getting it right, what that means is, do I have sustainable food that comes from somewhere I know? What degree is local on the agenda where I go to eat? That, that really starts to matter today. You know, and beyond even the food, the worker conditions, the pay, those are things that have been very big topics lately in the news. Those are continuing to service to the forefront. And ultimately, the restaurant industry has got a lot of challenges on figuring out how to really dial in to where their consumer is demanding that they go. And when you think about the futures already here, I look around, DC is a great place. Sweet Green is doing it right. You can see them today. They're doing it fresh. They're doing it right with their people. You know, there are models out there, right? You know, there are out in the West Coast, places like Mendocino Farms and Tender Green. There are small models that are gonna be the next wave of growth in our industry. They're all small today, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 stores. But over the next decade, this will be the next wave, these next generation restaurants. Um, and you can see that future happening, but there's a reality to that that's a little different as well. And that is, it's the distributed part, right? While that may be the future, how it's distributed has really got to change. And I think ultimately, when you think about it, it's access. You know, if, I want to get, if I'm here today and I want to go get a great salad, I can go to Sweet Green, and I can get it fresh, I know where it's coming from, it's sustainable. But I tell you, I drove here from Syracuse yesterday, and between here and there, you know, it may not be a food desert, but I don't know what, you don't really kind of know what you're eating in most of the places in the country. It's, it's actually, it's very hard to find high quality, well, transparent, sustainable food that the average person can access at a price point that they can get to. And I think ultimately the idea of distribu distributing a better food system is really where a lot of the action starts to show up for us. And you think about it, companies like Panera and Chipotle, who I think have been trying to take as much of a lead as we can in the industry and push further, um, we're trying to move beyond sort of the old, the old way things have always been done in this business. And the reality is, a lot of restaurant chains are facing some very tough choices. You know, they're going to have to decide somewhere between profitability, sustainability, consumer, consumer outreach, and ultimately the ability to be relevant with an, with an audience is changing and it's changing quickly. So the challenge really out there today is, how do we make that happen? And, and what's been interesting and rewarding for me at Panera is we've been able to sort of take the idea of getting larger and scaling up and using that for good. So our, our ideas have been, how do you take things like, and create things like the antibiotic-free chicken industry for the restaurant business? That didn't exist until we found out the customers were looking for that. We could find the product, we could do it right, we could get it in front of a customer, and they'd respond and they would drive top line, which then drove bottom line. That model started to drive an industry. Chipotle, in the same sort of vein, you see the success that they've had over the last 20 years, driven by the fact that people want to know where their food's coming for, from, and they want to make a difference in how they're eating. And I think companies like Chipotle and Panera and the others out there today that are pushing harder on their systems are helping drive a wedge and try to help change, really, how people interact with food today. And I'm talking about the daily stuff. You know, it's the every day what you're eating that really matters. So ultimately, the big challenge here for us is how do we continue to help drive that? Because really, these smaller chains, as they grow, they're going to need support from a larger supply system as well. So we're out there pushing, and I think, again, more companies are trying to figure out how do you make this big difference in the world through your suppliers by using your customers. And I'd say that's the next thing that's very important on the agenda. You're going to hear a lot more about it in the next coming years. Is as restaurant companies pushing back on their suppliers to find out how they can be more sustainable. I know that as we've been working through this whole uh, taking, removing the um, artificial colors and flavors and preservatives from our menu, it's creating a lot of angst for our suppliers. They're having to figure out new ways to do things. But they know if they want to stay with us, they're going to have to solve this. So we're actually able to use the consumer voice to help push forward a real change in the industry. And we're starting to see it happen. And I know that Chipotle is pushing on those same sorts of things. I think the more that large restaurant chains can embrace this, make the tough decisions, push their vendors, they're going to have the ability to be relevant for the customers in the future. And I tell you, in today's world, I know there's a lot of talk about the customer can't drive it sometimes. In the restaurant business, the customer completely drives it. And today, more so than ever. Think about the socially transparent world we live in today. You can't do anything without everybody knowing about it and talking about it. On top of that, think about the world of big data and all the information that we have at our access now through loyalty programs and, and electronic payment process. We now know better than ever what motivates customers and the industry is responding. 
And I, the biggest thing I can tell you is consumers continue to make sure that you're driving and sharing the kind of values that you have with the places you're doing business, with those kind of restaurant chains, because ultimately the customer is in the driver's seat more than ever as it comes to driving sustainability through the food system. The restaurant companies will respond, and those that don't won't end up surviving. And those that do will be able to take that distribution and make a huge opportunity out of it, and that's really the, will be the winners in the next generation of restaurant concepts. Thank you. Okay, it's great to be here for this amazing panel of fantastic people. We're gonna be talking a lot about the supply chain, actually, which is, I think, one of the most fascinating areas in this conversation about the, the business of food. Uh, we've got a great panel here. To my immediate left is Nora, Nora Poulion uh, of Restaurant Nora. She is a, if any of you are from Washington, D.C., you know she is a pioneer and a champion of organic, environmentally conscious cuisine. Uh, she opened Restaurant Nora in 1979, and she's been working with farmers to supply the restaurant with seasonal organic producer produce while introducing other D.C. chefs to these farmers as well. And in 1999, she beca her restaurant became the first certified or organic restaurant in the U.S., and very few restaurants have accomplished that since then. It's really pretty amazing. To her left <coughs> is Brad Nelson of Marriott Hotels and Resorts. He has been in the food and beverage industry for 37 years. He oversees the culinary strategy for 18 global lodging brands in Marriott International's lo lodging portfolio, including Ritz Carlton, JW Marriott, Renaissance, Marriott Courtyard, Moxie, Spring Hill Suites, and residents in across 3,800 hotels in 71 countries. Uh, we've got Vicky Rateau to his left. She's the campaign manager for Oxfam America's national and international organizing and advocacy efforts around food security and climate change. And she's played a leadership role in a number of global poverty campaigns for the past 11 years, including Oxfam International's Make Trade Fair campaign. Paul Willis of Nyman Ranch is a co-founder and manager of the Nyman Ranch Pork Company. He is still living and working on the farm he grew up on. Uh, he formed a partnership with Nyman Ranch in 1995 and since then has, been, has acted as a hog farming crusader, encouraging more than 500 like-minded family farmers to raise free-range pigs exclusively for Nyman Ranch. <laughs> and last but not least, Joshua Brow is program manager for food with integrity at Chipotle Mexican Grill, where he works to develop and execute Chipotle's vision for changing the way people think about and eat fast food. So welcome all of you. So we've got, we've got producers here and manufacturers of food, and we've got buyers of food, uh, like Chipotle and Marriott and Restaurant Nora. Um, so we're, I'm gonna start with Chipotle. Chipotle has been in the news lately, of course. Our Carnita Gate, perhaps we might call it. Um, <laughs> about, about a third of all of Chipotle's restaurants are currently not serving carnitas because the restaurant chain has suspended one of its major pork suppliers. Uh, that supplier was not in compliance with the company's animal welfare standards. Um, and so, Josh, tell us, uh, you know, is this is this recent issue? Is this an issue of of scaling up? Um, you know, you're, you're a company that's growing. You've set these really ambitious standards for animal welfare. You've you've gotten the industry, the, the the livestock industry, to respond, but you're still growing as a company, and and now you've kind of run into this little hurdle. So, is this is this an is this a truly an issue just of of scaling up and getting bigger and bigger? Well, so I like to think about things in in either the short term or the the long term. I mean, I, I think when it comes to the short term it's not necessarily a scale issue so much as it, it is really an operational issue. But in, in the long run, it's, it's absolutely a, a, a challenge as Chipotle, you know, we have about 1,700 restaurants today and we're adding between 150 and 200 restaurants a year. So the uh, supply chain that we've developed over the years, and you know, Paul can do a much better job uh, of talking about certain pieces of that th th than I can, um, but that supply chain, uh, you know, really needs to grow along with us. And I think 
um, you know, as we face this, this short-term shock and are, are looking to continue to, to grow our supply, not only of, of pork, but really all of the ingredients that we buy, um, yeah, we're, we're really going to need to see the growth of, of uh, you know, farmers who are, are producing food in the way that, that we hope they'll do it. And so, uh, Paul, what would you say? What, what do we need to, to get more of that, the supply of these ingredients to companies like Chipotle, Panera, all the other ones that may be asking for antibiotic-free meat, free-range pork, uh, organic products? What, what's needed to, to, to increase this supply? Well, we need more farmers. <laughs> uh, it's as simple as that. I mean, what, uh, <clears throat> the United States has less than 1% of their people that are actually farming. Probably, I, I think it's the lowest in the world. And uh, <coughs> I kind of look at other, what I consider really healthy food systems, uh, uh, some of the Mediterranean countries, uh, Poland, places like this. Uh, you have 10 to 20% of the people that are farming. So we're a little low on numbers of actual farmers. Uh, for Nyman Ranch, kind of one of the bright spots is our average uh, farmers are about 10 years younger than farmers in general. That's a good sign. Uh, one of the things that's kind of stalled us out a little bit on the uh, increasing our supply uh, over, the, over the past uh, three or four years has been uh, uh, the ethanol craze. Uh, <clears throat> price of a barrel of oil relates to food production, especially ethanol. Uh, uh, feed prices went to uh, more than double of what they had been. Raising a pig, uh, about 80% of the cost is, is, is feed. Now that's backed off. Uh, we put a lot of uh, incentives for finding new farmers, for uh, our existing farmers increasing their supply. And we're moving forward and, you know, but it takes time. You know, even if you uh, if you make the decision today, you know, it, it's a year before anything is going to be in the market. It isn't, you know, it's, it's not there. These animals have to be, uh, you have to have breeding stock, the breeding takes place, the gestation, the feeding, the raising and everything. Uh, just for pigs alone, it's a year. But, but it's, it's moving forward. We have uh, uh, worked with Chipotle since, uh, what, 2000? Yep. So a long time. Now, when we started, we used to say we could add uh, another farmer every time Chipotle opened a restaurant. However, they got very uh, moving along very quickly, and we, we just couldn't quite keep up with them. So initially, we were an exclusive supplier, but then they, they had to go and look for other uh, like-minded uh, uh, companies, I guess you'd say, to uh, supply them. They, uh, Chipotle buys a certain part of the animal, uh, not the entire animal, and that's always a challenge too in, in uh, marketing a specialty product. Uh, we, you have uh, animals and they're slaughtered and you have a carcass and you have all kinds of parts on it. And it very, uh, you know, uh, early on I was trying to find a market for, if you will, free-range pigs uh, because uh, basically the industry was changing into the industrial model and I didn't like that. And uh, a lot of people wanted to buy a pork chop, and I, I, I wasn't raising pork chops, I was raising <laughs> pigs. So, uh, you know, that's the challenge, too. And we've, we've gone a long ways, and Chipotle has helped with solving that for us. Well, and and you're, you're out there in, in Iowa, in, in hog country, and I mean, what do you hear from, from people in those communities in terms of the interest in raising the kind of pork that you're, you're well, raising? Uh, I'm going from here to Practical Farmers of Iowa. Uh, it's an organization. There are some organic farmers, uh, 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 some uh, uh, diversified farms. There's quite a range of farmers, but they tend to be not mainstream large uh, grain farmers, if you will. And uh, their membership has increased from 1,700 to 2,500 just this past year. Wow. That's a good sign. And from my understanding, there seems to be quite a lot of interest, and especially younger people, of, of uh, raising pigs the way we require this with high animal welfare standards without drugs, to be doing this uh, uh, and, and incorporating that, this as an enterprise on a diversified farm. It's, in, in our case, it's not what these 
farmers do it. Just that's the only thing they do. It tends to be an enterprise. Okay. Uh, and, and Nora, you you also are a buyer of food, and uh, and you are committed to buying only organic produce and other organic products. And that hasn't always been easy for you, has it? No, and I can very much relate to what you're saying because when I started out, I had to buy whole animals. And mm -hmm. each time I bought a beef, which I think I bought every three weeks or four weeks, I had, I think, like 600 pounds of ground meats. And, you know, <laughs> I said I will open a, a, a groundhog restaurant because I had so much ground meat. But so I can relate uh, to uh, what you're saying. Yeah, I think, I think my supply chain has come full circle. I think when I started out in the 70s, I, I opened a restaurant in 79, which is now 37 years ago. Uh, you know, the world was very different. And it was difficult to find suppliers then. I had to drive in the countryside and find farmers and ask them how they farm. And, you know, convince them that they would uh, sell to me and that they wouldn't use so many pesticides or fungicides. You know, around here, lots of fungicides, unfortunately, and so uh, hormones or antibiotics. And so uh, that's how I, I got my, my, my products and word got around that there's this crazy woman <laughs> in Washington buying from farmers. And so I got more and more farmers that contacted me, but it was, very difficult to get them organic, you know, they, they were natural, they didn't, so it was a difficult time and also as you said, we heard before, it's customer driven, you know, customers had no idea what I was trying to do. I mean, the word organic didn't exist. If I would have said, you know, I have an organic restaurant, people would have said, you know, what is this, a biology class or, you know, what is this? So I tried to invent a title and say additive free I'm serving additive-free food. And so that was difficult to understand too because people thought I don't do MSG. But uh, so I decided to mark it on my menu and I had on my menu written in the back of my menu exactly what my philosophy was and what I'm trying to do. And I gave the list of all the farmers that I use so people could uh, start to learn uh, that it's important to know where their food comes from. So. Uh, then, you know, the 80s and the 90s and people became, unfortunately, two things happened. People became unhealthy and more and more people sort of started to come to the restaurant because they had health issues or dietary issues, lots of allergies and cancer and diabetes and, you know, obesity and uh, or cardiovascular problems. And then the other thing that happened is that environmental organizations realized uh, also the impact of food on the environment. So they came to support me. So now what we are now down is, uh, now I, I had all these suppliers and things were doing very well, but now so many other companies, and I'm happy about this, I must say, because you know one of the big criticism of organic food is that it's so elitist and that nobody can afford it. And I always say, you know, better to spend your money on food than on a doctor. <laughs> And uh, uh, so now it's become often difficult to get the amount of products or the products I want because, you know, there's Walmart, there's Costco, there's Safeway, there's China, all these uh, chains that realize that actually serving organic food, as we heard before, you know, the millennium want healthier food. You know, uh, they, they now do this I think organic food is 2% of, 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 uh, of, of the agricultural land is farmed organically. Think about it, only 2%. And all these big companies and everybody, you know, grabs onto it. So me, my poor little restaurant, I have only one. <laughs> I'm sort of pushed aside a little and I have to fight again to find, uh, you know, uh, certified organic products like I had over 30 years ago. So, that's sort of uh, the cycle, but I have to say I'm very happy. I'm very happy that it's come to this point because organic will become more mainstream and uh, I think it will benefit everybody. 
And so for you, do you think the answer is also perhaps more farmers, more organic farmers definitely. To, to, to fortify your supply? N yes, definitely. As if you have heard, it's true. There's, uh, actually, actually, there's a little change I can see because some of the farms that I go and visit there, it's for them easier and easier to find help in the summer when they need help, you know, a farm from agricultural school. There are more, more and more younger people that are willing to go back to, uh, to farming and many of them, of course, go out of ideological principles because they think it's, that's the correct way of doing it. But, you know, unfortunately, some of them are discouraged when they realize how difficult it is to be a farmer and how hard work it is and how you're dependent on so many things, you know, on the weather and on the customer. Or, you know, sometimes they, somebody says, okay, I, w I can see it with me. I mean, you know, my farmer says, okay, I can supply with the arugula you ordered, but it's full of, of flea beetle holes. So, you know, there's always uh, the poor farmer is uh, very dependent on the environment and the weather. So, so whether you're a, a small business like, like Nora's or a very, very large business like Marriott, the, this issue of sp tight supply can be, can be tricky, right? And uh, Brad, you set a really interesting goal of, of uh, offering only cage-free eggs by 2015, correct? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Foolishly, maybe. But. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been working on this for three years, um, and and it's it's pretty challenging to source entirely cage-free eggs. Uh, and this is is this just for the U.S. Well, operations? I, I think it's uh, well, it's really uh, America's. So I would say just the U.S. Okay. Uh, Toronto to Sao Paulo. Um, but I, I think it's really an example of the challenges in supply and demand. I mean, so. You know, with, with any market, uh, we need to build the supply and then create the demand to be able to balance against that supply. And I think we are still in uh, that balancing act right now where we know there's a lot of desire. We know a lot of people like, you know, filled in this room here that uh, we all firmly believe what's being said and we want to act on that. And yet, uh, oftentimes that doesn't necessarily come through with the masses or with the, uh, the, the general population. So building that story, the last panel I thought was actually something that we need to do a lot more talking about of how to tell a story that's reasonable and that is scalable. Um, the cage-free egg thing, the, uh, you know, we did trans fats uh, eight years ago. We did, uh, we were doing crate-free pork, which I don't want to get into too much. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, it really is a challenge because Anybody will grow or raise or sell you anything if you agree to buy it at a certain price. And uh, there is a premium for anything that we are talking about in this room that has this story. And whether that premium is truly warranted or not is sometimes debatable. But it does cost more money to do some of these things that we're talking about. And at the end of the day, if this panel is called the business of food, this is a business, and restaurants are not nonprofit organizations. Or there was an old joke that if you wanted to open a nonprofit, then go open a restaurant. <laughs> um, so I think you know it is. You know, it's it's a it's it's not an ideological thing for me. Although I do have you know I grew up in Seattle, and I, somebody from Whidbey Island was here on the, on the earlier panel. That's where actually where I want to retire. <laughs> um, but. Uh, and I worked for many years in San Francisco, and I get all of that. There is a difference from scaling it from a single entity or a single location, coast, city, to globally, uh, you know, across 4,300 hotels with, I don't even know how many restaurants we have, to be honest with you. It's a, it's a, a huge number. Um, and the ability to actually fill that supply gap where the demand is there. And so I think it really is that. The cage-free egg thing, um, you know, we, we, uh, one of my beliefs is that I actually have the ability to kind of influence these larger producers because I truly am a, we, not I, <coughs> our company can be a big deal to, you know, pork supplier, egg supplier, or whatever. Um, but we have to agree to actually pay that 30% premium. And we have to agree that, you know, breakfast is one of the places where these eggs are used, and according to, you know, with a lot of other locations. 
Um, but how much more can I actually charge for a breakfast buffet? Those of you that are, uh, we appreciate your business, but I mean, I mean, how much more can I really charge? So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it is a margin-based business as well. And so when we can actually start changing some of the dialogue um, about cost and value from margin to more bottom line as, as well as top line and, and good that it does, then that's a good thing. Um, you know, hotels are not, we don't, we manage. Uh, we don't own the properties. So it's a, it's a different business model as well. And given the, the global scale of your company with mm. 4,300 hotels around the world, right? I mean, are you concerned with sourcing not just cage free eggs, but other things you might, you know, other targets or priorities that you might be setting down the line for, for food? Uh, I mean, is there really the supply there? Yeah, no, I think that's a huge issue. So I, I think it really becomes a regional and global issue. So um, we have, you know, lots of, lots of great resources here and in Europe um, to be able to source locally and have some of these, uh, the, some of these uh, things that we uh, employ in the, in the sourcing. In other parts of the world, you know, we're opening a hotel uh, in three weeks in Haiti. First, First, uh, first company to go in and actually build after, you know, the terrible earthquake. And uh, we have spent, uh, I don't know how many trips um, our teams have gone down to actually source the basics, um, you know, chicken and produce. And, and essentially we are building um, the infrastructure in some ways to act by actually committing to these farmers uh, that, yeah, we'll buy everything you grow. We'll, no matter what you grow, we'll figure out a way to use it on the menu, we'll buy it. But at the same time, um, the majority of product that we actually have to source is going down in a container because there is no access. Um, we have the same problem in the Caribbean sometimes with seafood, believe it or not. Place surrounded by water and surrounded by beautiful fish, uh, pretty tough to get ice in some of those boats. So some of the infrastructure challenges um, is, is an issue. Uh, I, I just. About two hours ago, I was answering an email uh, from our, our group that uh, operates the operations in, um, in China, northern China. And we had just come out with, for one of our particular brands, a requirement um, that, that each hotel has uh, a kitchen garden, a chef's garden. And it's something we've been doing for years, but we actually came out with a brand policy on this particular saying you have to have a garden. Well, Beijing sent me a note and said, have you ever been to Beijing? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, it's, it's not that easy. Um, and I, I guess, you know, my belief is that building the, the demand will then encourage more people to farm, encourage more access to the product, but it really is a balance and one can't start without the other. Uh, Vicky, so Oxfam has also been very, very involved with uh, influencing supply chain and big food companies. Uh, you've created the Behind the Brand Scorecard where you are looking at the commitments of the big 10 food companies towards the way they source agricultural commodities from developing countries. Uh, you're evaluating companies on issues like community land rights, workers, women, water, and pushing companies to set specific uh, targets and goals. And, and so um, you know, where have you found sort of the the, the, the pressure points where you can really get in there and, and uh, convince a, a huge company like Unilever or Coca-Cola that has a massive global sup and super complex supply chain to actually make some changes in there. Thanks, Eliza. Um, so our Behind the Brands campaign is an effort to bring a, many issues, social and environmental issues together. I think a lot of my colleagues here have talked about um, just the growing movement around environmental concerns. Um, and we think it's really important how farmers are being treated um, and how the risk that they have to bear on an everyday basis is shared across the supply chain and not just by farmers. Um, that women are empowered because by empowering women, we can truly address the issues of hunger um, and by how workers are treated. Um, so those are just three of some of the indicators um, in the scorecard. Um, and so we want, and what we're seeing is a trend where these social issues are on par with environmental issues, that more and more companies um, in the food and beverage industry are taking on commitments um, and paying more attention, um, and paying more attention to things like 
will they tolerate um, communities and farmers being displaced off their lands due to a rush for agricultural land, um, due to a rush for, um, to grow palm for palm oil. Um, and our pressure points, the scorecard has been incredibly instrumental um, in moving these large, ten, the big 10 as we call them, food and beverage companies. Um, the scorecard is a race to the top. It's a way to positively engage companies um, across these seven indicators. Um, the issues or themes were um, issues that we thought were very important and oftentimes neglected by food and beverage companies, but there was deep and early dialogue with companies about if we were to hard, ask you hard questions on these themes, what are those hard questions that should be asked? What should companies be ranked on? Um, and so that started early. Um, and so it's been a critical tool in positively engaging um, these industry giants. Um, and the whole campaign rests on this belief that consumers can move these huge companies. Um, you know, these huge companies, their revenue on a daily basis is $1.1 billion. They employ millions of people. Um, I think over the year, the 10 companies generate $450 billion. And if we can get these companies on board on some of these issues, it will send, you know, it will reverberate through value chains and through the industry. Um, and that's what we've seen on the issues that we've gone out there with. Um, we can touch on it at another point, but periodically we'll take one of these themes and then a commodity um, to make it easy to, for people to understand, for consumers to be involved in. Um, so for example, we took cocoa um, and women's empowerment um, and pushed the three largest cocoa companies um, on women's empowerment issues. Then we looked at land rights and how to um, support community land rights um, and sh sugar was the commodity we took. And then the latest was um, climate change or carbon emissions um, and palm oil. Um, and about seven, more than 700,000 consumers have hopped on and, and worked with us. And those have really been the two big points. Okay, great. And it's, it's interesting um, that you focused more on, on the social issues, the way that these companies um, impact uh, or have, have an impact on poverty and, and small farmers. And, 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 and why is it that you've kind of chosen that as, I mean, I know that is Oxfam's priority, right? But, but um, can you tell us a little bit about how these huge companies are af affecting uh, poverty? Absolutely. So we, we do think the companies can play a role in addressing hunger in their supply chains. Um, and one of uh, the, some of the reasons that we chose these companies, partly it does have to do with Oxfam's identity as a humanitarian and international development organization, um, but we also pinpointed issues that are neglected um, by food and beverage companies, uh, but are critical in addressing hunger, critical in addressing how do we feed 9 billion people by 2050, um, and also critical in addressing how do we uh, support sustainable uh, agriculture production um, and having a, a more just food system um, so these seven issues all fit, you know, in addition to the social issues, um, I just identified things like um, water, uh, uh, use of water, um, shortage of water, climate change, um, our environmental ones that are included in, in, the, in the scorecard as well. Um, but they are all part, they are, they are all key elements in what we think is needed for a sustainable and just food system. So back to the U.S., back to Chipotle. Um, you know, we've been talking, and, and obviously the, the animal welsh, welfare issue has been one that has been up, we've been talking about a lot. Where does Chipotle uh, fit in with the social justice issue and, the, and the creating a more just food system? I mean, is that something that, that you're prioritizing as well? And, and, how, and where is that fit in, in in the U.S. food system? Sure, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a hugely important part of our overall ethos. I mean, from my perspective, one of the most interesting things and, and unfortunate things that, that uh, we've seen over the last 5, 10, 15 years where there's been this proliferation of interest in all sorts of issues around food, the kind of, uh, of, of interest that makes an event like this one possible, you know, the, the big missing piece of this has largely been the people. I mean, we, we really care about how animals are raised. We care about, you know, what, what's sprayed or is not sprayed on, on the the crops that we're eating, but you know, in, in many ways, uh, folks 
haven't really put a lot of emphasis on the, the people involved in bringing their food uh, from the farm to the table. It, it's a hugely important part of, of what Chipotle does on, on two fronts. First of all, um, you know, on the farm, you know, a big portion of the premium that we're paying to farmers uh, and to our suppliers is um, you know, not only uh, focused on you know, creating an incentive for, um, for producers to raise ingredients in the way that, uh, that we'd like, in a way that follows our protocols, but, but those protocols in include um, elements um, that, you know, re requirements for uh, wages and, and treatment of workers and all, all these things. The, the more interesting story from, from my perspective is the people culture that we have in our restaurants. And frankly, it's one that we're able to influence a lot more because uh, the, the folks who work in our restaurants are, are Chipotle employees. And you know, unlike a typical fast food company where um, you know, most fast food restaurants are franchised, um, you know, if you look at McDonald's or Burger Kings of the world, McDonald's, I want to say, is about 85% franchise. Burger King, I believe, is at 100% now. Chipotle owns all of our restaurants, and the only way we're going to grow is if we have people who uh, can come up through the ranks and run, you know, manage the next Chipotle. So we have the, the good fortune of, um, you know, incentives for, the, you know, the, the company being aligned with, um, you know, the well-being of our workers. So the way that, um, if you come into one of our restaurants as a crew member, the, all of the training that you're doing, the work you're doing day to day, and the way that um, your, your colleagues are, are focused on, on bringing you up through the system is all focused on getting you to that point where you can one day manage a, a restaurant of your own. And you know, when, when you get to that point and then beyond within, uh, within our, the, the Chipotle network, you, know, you can earn a, a, a you know, really great living, and so you know that we're always focused on uh, you know making sure that, that our people have opportunities because it's it's not just because you know we want to provide them with the opportunities because it's the only way that the company will grow. And and what about at Marriott, Brad? Is, is well, social justice figuring <laughs> into your culinary strategy too? Well, I can't answer no to that. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, absolutely, and, and I, I I think. <laughs> I think I think the the key is honestly, you know, we we're a hotel company. We we're a place where we want you to come visit, whether it's for business, pleasure, see family, whatever. Uh, we want you know really to be uh, thought of as part of your your daily life in some regards. And and, and flip side of that is typically hotels, traditionally hotels, were kind of the center of the community. Uh, Particularly full service hotels, and I, and I think you know we still have that opportunity in a in a very competitive and somewhat fragmented uh, uh, industry. It's really an exciting time to be in the industry, but to be a part of the community is 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 central to the the uh, the philosophy of operating hotels. Certainly central to uh, the Marriott family, who you know started as a root beer stand 87 years ago here in D.C. Um, and so how we go about doing that as it relates to food is embrace local, but really embrace the sustainability of that community in local. In, in, in local. I, I kind of hate the word sustainability anymore because it's, it's, it's greenwashed more than anything else. Uh, to me, sustainability is actually being in, uh, in a relationship with that community where you are helping each other. And so we've got a number of projects, um, a number of different examples of that. You know, we, we, in, in northern China, we, we helped with a, uh, a clean water program. Actually, water is a real big issue for us, um, a social issue. Uh, and so we are, we are helping this community that used to do uh, clear cutting of, of logging and, and flooding the streams with silt uh, by helping them actually establish uh, bee farming and uh, buying the honey and that kind of stuff, as well as mushrooms from this particular part of the world. Uh, in northern Thailand, um, Typically, the only industry in northern Thailand uh, was, quite honestly, growing opium. And the, royal, the, the king the royal, established a royal project where he went to these opium farmers and convinced them to grow vegetables and to sell them to restaurants and hotels in Bangkok. And so we are a huge 
a user of whatever they will buy, whatever they will grow in our hotels in Bangkok and around. And even, in, even here in the, in the US, in Charlotte, um, we got involved with this project where a, a, a technology venture capitalist wanted to actually in, in, uh, have broadband brought into these rural farmhouses and rural farm, farm communities. And the only way that they actually wanted anything to do with it, well, they didn't, and they didn't, they didn't want to just be having people surfing the, the net, was to actually establish some sort of a uh, commerce. And so came up with the idea that if each one of these 85 farmers, instead of growing tobacco, grew produce and vegetables, he could consolidate it under one co-op, and then local hotels and chefs could order from that co-op that would be local. And so we are heavily involved with that. So I think... You know, yeah, we're a global company. We've got 72 countries or 71 and 4,300 hotels. And I think that was said 18 brands. I think we're now at 21. Um, it, it continues to grow, but at the end of the day, it really is about kind of a local engagement with, uh, with our customers and, our, and also our associates who are guests and, and associates, just like Chipotle employees and customers. So I think that's part of everything we try and do. You can't scale that, which makes it kind of frustrating to answer some of the questions because, you know, uh, it's not scalable. It's only scalable on a local basis uh, and trying to build that supply demand. Thank you. Okay, I think we are ready to take some questions from the audience. Yep, go ahead. Is there a mic? So I really like what you said about sustainability being kind of a partnership and being mutually beneficial to suppliers and to your brand. I work as a buyer for a butcher grocery store in Boston. And uh, the challenge I, we face is that um, we work with a lot of local suppliers. I mean, 50% of our grocery comes within 50 miles. Um, our meat, 75% of it's within 250 miles. And we try, I'm kind of fortunate, I started this position six months ago. We tried to uh, do everything right, and now that, that I'm the buyer, even doing that more so, as I've been being at the Food Tank Summit, that's kind of my ideals. Um, but I, I'm kind of wondering, like with Chipotle, like I'm amazed by you guys, because you sell burritos at nine, ten dollars know, maybe it's a little bit less, um, but you pay your workers, you pay your vendors, um, you try to, to be sustainable. Like how, how does that work for a business? Um, because we're trying to figure out like, is it setting lower margins for profit? Is it, um, you know, what do you take a hit on while you're waiting for supply and demand to kind of meet up where you, you can really be profitable? Sure, well, I, I think it's a really important question. I ate lunch at Chipotle yesterday with, uh, a couple of people who I had been meeting with uh, just before lunch who, who don't work for the company. And um, our office is near Union Square in New York, so I go to our Union Square North restaurant, which is at the corner of 17th Street and Broadway. It's an extremely uh, high foot traffic area. The restaurant's always busy. I've never been in there and not seen it really humming along. The line yesterday was just out the door, and we got into the line. And I would say within 10 minutes, uh, we were out of there with our food and took it back to the office. So, you know, I, I'm assuming you, you've been in our restaurants. Um, the, the secret sauce is, is really, uh, you know, not so much in the food, it's in the operations. And it, it's partially due to this people culture that I mentioned, um, but partially due to just the, the way that the, the model is designed. We're able to uh, move people through very quickly and still provide them with a really high quality meal of food that, um, you know, it's not the reheated, frozen, processed food that you're getting in most fast food restaurants, but it's, it's you know, food cooked from whole ingredients. And, it, it, you know, I, I think ultimately it's about the simplicity of the menu. We're using a very limited number of ingredients and, uh, you know, we're, we're doing J just as, as much as we need to make them delicious, but no more than that. And, I, I, you know, we're able to, to create this really great dining experience that people want to come back to very efficiently. Okay, we've got a question here from uh, this, oops, from online, from Andrew St. John. 
Even with the proliferation of sustainable supply chains in independent and commercial restaurant sourcing, there still remains a large population skeptical of the benefits. How can we convince those people of the beneficial impact on them as individual consumers? This sort of gets to the question, the point about the story. Um, do you want to take this one, Nora? Well, I think, I think the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. I think, you know, look around, our health problems are enormous. I mean, the cost, uh, uh, not only, you know, the human uh, suffering, but also the monetary, you know, um, output that this country has to put because of health problems. And I really think it's all related to what we put into our bodies. And, it's food, it's water, and it's air. And I think our food is not very nutritional anymore and full of chemical additives. Our air is uh, polluted and our water is contaminated. I mean, we have how many, 25 different chemicals we have to put in our water in Washington, D.C. to make it drinkable. So, so I think, I think, uh, I think that we have to, uh, I know it's very difficult to change and it's very difficult to acknowledge, but I think that we have to acknowledge this and we have just to take that step, as I said before, to spend the money. You know, in Europe, food is so much more expensive than in this country. In this country, it's all how much can you eat for the least amount of money. It's such a wrong philosophy. I mean, you have to think how, what nutritional food can I get? What is the best quality I can get, not what is the quantity? And I think slowly we have to change this whole and then uh, this whole uh, lifestyle and life uh, thinking of people to, to, to make a difference. I'm Katie Kiefer from Heritage Radio Network. Um, I'm going to throw this out to any of you guys, but Brad and, and Paul, this is, and, and Josh, maybe more to your points. But um, I was recently arguing with somebody on Facebook about sort of animal welfare, animal rights. And the thing that I always find <coughs> absent in, um, in just sort of talking in general about um, industrialized um, meat production, and the thing that I always find absent in some of these discussions is, is, is sort of like, how, how do we bring the big scale producers to the table? And I, I, you know, I love that Nyman Ranch has done so well. I'm thrilled that there are more and more producers following this model. But the fact is, they only produce a small fraction of the amount of product that we produce overall in this country. Nine billion chickens, for example. Most of them live in appalling conditions. Where, when are we going to start engaging with big suppliers and start using the power of a Marriott, of a Chipotle, to really push that needle forward? And, and the second part of the question is, how do you guys convince um, your superiors that that kind of change is worth their while to invest in? Well, we're doing it. I mean, we're having, <coughs> excuse me, we're having those conversations because we have to, you know. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're growing really fast, and, and this week, uh, you know, the last couple of weeks has shown that, um, you know, we're, we're go going to face uh, challenges to our, our supply as we grow. I think the, the key point in the conversation for me is that the, the big producers are locked in a very commodity-focused mindset. And if you look at what we're doing, if you look at, at, at what Paul uh, and Nyman are doing, is that they're kind of decommodifying these ingredients that have, for the last 50 years, been considered commodities. And I think, you know, when, when you have a, a restaurant chain where all of the, you know, we're not producing the ingredients that we're cooking with in our restaurants. Those are coming from, from farms and other suppliers, but it's all branded as Chipotle food. And I think that our, our suppliers, and you know, especially as we talk to some of, of the bigger players, they're starting to see that you know, it's not just a niche thing, it's not just uh, you know, the, the Chez Panisses and Blue Hills of the world, that um, you know, th this really makes sense will, and will make sense for them on a larger scale, but they have to you know, really mo start moving away from this commodity model that, frankly, you know, 
creates very few benefits economically for all but a, a very few number of players. And so, you know, we're having those conversations, but I think that it takes a lot of time to, to change the way that, that people think about, about the business that they've been doing for decades. I, th I, think, I think it has to come from the consumer. We heard this at the beginning that the millennium also are demanding, you know, healthier food. Now. And it, that's true. I think it's the people who can make the change. It's only the people, because the people should demand what they need and what they want. And then the companies, because they look at the bottom line, they have to change to, to, uh, to, to uh, satisfy this uh, demand. Paul, do you want to add anything? Well, one of the things I want to mention is that our farmers own and take care of their pigs themselves. So when they get a check, it goes to that farmer. That farmer spends the money within that community. And that really is rural development. And the Nyman Ranch has, has paid millions of dollars to their farmers over the years. But if you added, let's say, $25 per pig to that farmer, it'd make a big difference in the supply. It, there has to be uh, some money to be made for work. <coughs> farmers to do this. Uh, they're doing something unique and special and they have to be paid a unique and special price. And we do pay a premium price. And the other thing I wanted to add is when we started with Chipotle, uh, they paid us more per pound of pork. And I think they raised the price of a carnita 50 cents or a dollar or something. And, I, and they, the story wasn't told or anything like that. It was just the ingredient changed and uh, Chipotle sales of the carnitas went up 300 percent in a very short time. So that goes back to the, you know, how do you convince people? They have to taste it. A lot, there's a lot to that element of it. I also just want to jump in and say, um, to change the large producers, you have to go to large buyers. Um, and it, I, I think we have an, um, a very idealistic desire where um, the whole production model changes. But the reality is that there are these very large producers, and we want to change the way they um, deal with natural resources or take advantage of natural resources, then you have to affect where the money comes from. Um, and that's partly why we focused on the big actors in the industry. Do you want to well, I think part of the question was about educating people to uh, influence the commodity manufacturers to do something different. Uh, and, and I think there is way too much education being thrown out there and way too many messages and, and whatnot. And people are really confused. Confused by the terms, confused by how, what it means to them, confused. Do you mean, sorry, do you mean the producers or the consumers? I think the consumers. Mm -hmm. Again, this whole word sustainable. I, I think there's so many different definitions. So it, it really is about uh, kind of simplifying the message to some degree and then, and then kind of finding uh, what's important to you and standing by that. I mean, when Chipotle first opened, uh, uh, you know, I think it was an amazing story because you went and you read their story and that wasn't necessarily your story, but you kind of embraced it. And I think that's what your customers have loyally done. Um, and yet, you know, you do have just a few things on your menu and you, you stand for a certain number of things and you don't really go off that. I don't see you doing fish tacos. Um, People are trying to get us to do yeah, that. I'm sure they are. <laughs> so there is that, that sense of restraint as well. But, you know, the commodity industry, you, you know, uh, uh, food manufacturing has become very efficient. The rest of the world is trying to embrace that efficiency while we are at the same time trying to, in many ways, actually uh, reduce some of that efficiency. I, I've, I've traveled and I've been through a lot of the big suppliers and I've been through you know, facilities that, clean, that, that kill as many hogs as you raise every year in one day. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole different world. And you know what? Um, in the last, last seven years, bacon has become the new vegetable along with <laughs> kale. So people are not changing, and they're not, they're not eating mounds and mounds of bacon only from, you know, Super premium producers like Nyman. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a it's kind of a it's the supply demand thing. You know, pe people will grow and sell whatever people will buy. So it is a long process, I think, to actually change uh, and get that right message out there in a way that is profitable. 
Yeah, but I think it's okay to eat bacon. It's okay to eat everything you want. It's just the way it has been raised and the way it has been treated and the way it has been served has to be done in a, sorry the word, sustainable way. <laughs> Personally, I agree with you. <laughs> you know, we, we did, you know, I started, I was the first hog farm and now we have 500. Yep. So there has been progress. Yep. You know, we just have to keep at it. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but um, please let's give our panel a round of applause here. Again, fantastic.